Session 32, Catholic Spiritualities. Our opening hymn is Sing Ye Praises to the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. God our Father, look upon us with love. You redeemed us and made us your children in Christ. Give us true freedom and bring us to the inheritance you promised through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your <clears throat> spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Have faith in God and faith in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. Otherwise, how could I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? I am indeed going to prepare a place for you. And then I shall come back and take you with me, that where I am, you also may be. You know the way that leads where I go. Lord, Thomas said, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I love this passage of the Gospel. I used it for my parents' funerals, reminding us that where Christ is, is the way, the truth, and the life. Today's subject matter is Catholic spiritualities. One of the first things we notice about people is how different we all are. As nationalities, as races, but as individuals. So what does the Church teach? about Catholic spiritualities, 
and the ways to come to the Father through Christ. In the communion of the saints, many and varied spiritualities developed throughout the history of the Church. For example, some holy persons have handed on their personal charisms or gifts, like the spirit of Elijah, so that their followers uh, to Elisha and John the Baptist, so that their followers may have a share in this spirit. A distinct spirituality can also arise in response to, a specific, to specific needs at certain points in history, such as the need for effective preaching perceived by St. Dominic. These different schools of Christian spirituality share in the Church's living tradition of prayer and are essential guides for the faithful. In their rich diversity, they are refractions or dispersions of the one pure light of the Holy Spirit, just as a prism breaks up or disperses the many colors in one ray of white light. Catholic Spiritualities Over the years, in the Church, many different schools of Christian spirituality have developed over the centuries. In their rich diversity, they all manifest the one pure light of the Holy Spirit. Some of the best known are desert spirituality, after the early desert hermits, like St. Anthony of Egypt, Augustinian, after St. Augustine, Benedictine, after St. Benedict, Carmelite, after the Order of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, Dominican, after St. Dominic, Franciscan, after St. Francis of Assisi, Ignatian, after St. Ignatius of Loyola, Salesian, after St. Francis de Sales, and Lay, for example, the various movements founded after Vatican II. So we'll go through them in that order, and at the end is an appendix saying how you can get in touch with the centers of this, these various spiritualities in the Vancouver Archdiocese. First of all, desert spirituality. Jesus said, if you want to be perfect, go, sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come, follow me. In response, St. Anthony of Egypt gave away, that was his two three hundreds, gave away all his goods in about 269, and about the year 285 retired to the desert as a hermit, growing his own food. In about 305, he came out of solitude to organize his followers, but he retired again in about 310. Now, you notice that he retired to be a hermit. He didn't want followers, but he attracted people. Antony and St. Paul the Hermit, who died about 340, about whom little is known, are seen as the founders of Christian monasticism. Antony did not found a monastery, but monasteries grew up around him. I'm just looking at um, footnote three, one of the oldest Christian monasteries in the world the fortress-like Coptic monastery of St. Anthony the Great, which is now an Orthodox monastery, stands to this day at an oasis in the Red Sea Mountains, 155 kilometers southeast of Cairo. It was founded about 356 on St. Anthony's burial site. St. Pacomius, about 300, established the first true monastery at Tabenizi, near Thebes in Egypt. Historical texts mention this monastery, but until 2005, very recently, there was no other evidence of its existence that early. Then, in that year, archaeologists found monks' rooms with private living areas and a central communal room complete with cooking utensils. Desert spirituality is characterized by solitude, prayer, asceticism, or spiritual exercise, 
and sacrifice. And it's not just from that early. Um, you, Father, received a lady into the church some 20, 30 years ago now, mm -hmm. yeah. who became a hermitess, a Benedictine hermitess, and still is, as far as we know, as far as I know. Yeah. Then Augustinian spirituality. St. Augustine, about the year 400, was born at Tagast in Africa. You might like to at the north, northeastern tip of what is now Algeria. He was the son of a Christian mother, St. Monica, and a pagan father, Patricius. After a wayward youth, he taught at Carthage, Rome, and Milan, and in 387 was baptized by St. Ambrose, then Bishop of Milan. Augustine founded a lay monastery, that is for lay people, at Tagast in 389, but he himself became a priest in 391, after just two years, auxiliary bishop of Hippo in Africa in 395, when he'd been a priest only four years, and bishop of Hippo in about 396. Augustine wrote extensively, and you can still find his writings in the website newadvent.org. In fact, his writings are the most frequent in, in the Divine Office for the Office of the Readings reading. yeah. on a daily basis. I would say probably a few times a month we have yeah. writings from St. Augustine, and they're incredibly beautiful and, right. and clear thinking. His sermons really belong in our course because when translated into English, it is plain English. <laughs> yeah. But he wrote extensively about his own conversion the Holy Trinity, God's grace, Christ, the kingdom of God, the human person, and human freedom. And in that footnote there, eight, you can, there's the website you need if you want to read any more of them. Augustine spirituality brings Catholic faith into daily life. Christians must not only hope for God's kingdom, but also help build it on earth. The purpose of Augustinian monasteries is not to teach or preach, but to build up the body of Christ through Christian love. Augustine's rule, written about 400, the oldest surviving rule in the West for consecrated people, contains only a few regulations for the government of monasteries. Its emphasis is on charity, agape, as the goal of Christian life. The superior is servant to the community, and the other members are urged to show him mercy. Monks and nuns are intent upon God through obedience, scripture reading, and meditation. They strive to imitate the first Christian communities, where there was one heart and one mind, and everything was held in common and shared according to need. Various religious orders follow Augustine's rule. First orders, so-called, for consecrated men, second orders for consecrated women, and third orders for laypeople. The foremost Augustinian saint, after Augustine, of course, is Monica, Augustine's mother, patroness of wives and mothers, whose decades of prayer helped convert her husband and her son. Then, Benedictine spirituality. St. Benedict, now this is more like 500, called, he's often called the father of Western monasticism, was born at Nursia, now Norcia in Italy, and educated in Rome. About 500, he retired to a grave at Subiaco, where he lived as a hermit. A cave, not a grave. Sorry. What did I say? A grave. Did I say a grave? Yes. He retired to a cave at Subiaco where he lived as a hermit. I went to the cave site of, um, at Subiaco when I was a seminarian in Rome. But I went in February when the weather was about 32 degrees Fahrenheit, just at the freezing point, sleet, cold, miserable. And that's the ideal time to see it because we 
you know, busloads of people tend to go in the summer yes. when the weather is nice. And you can think, oh, I could like to live yeah. out here. This would be very nice. He must have been cold and hungry and wet all the time in yeah. the winter. And it's not an easy life. It, it was a real revelation to see it at that, in that time of year. Anyway, again, other people joined him and he organized them into monasteries. About 525, he and a few others moved to Monte Cassino, Mount Cassino, where he composed his rule. He's buried there with his sister, Saint Scholastica. Now, as you may know, we have a Dominican, um, yes, no, sorry, Benedictine monastery in Mission, about 60 kilometers away from Vancouver. And the monk there who has done such marvelous beautiful artwork for the monastery, has just died at the end of last year, the very end of last year. But um, you can't, no, not that one, Father, the St. Benedict one. You can um, see his artwork, some of it, which is not in the monastery That's itself, right. or you can actually get pictures of it. This is one that I have on my wall. I hope you can see it. It's a young St. Benedict who flung himself into a thorn bush to escape temptation, rose above his temptation, and became abbot of the monastery. Um, I, can't, I can't read it properly. Somewhere it says on here, Monte Cassino. Here, Subiaco. And here in the corner is a very small replica of the bell tower in Mission well worth seeing. I'm sure you could probably find a, a copy of this online. It's very lovely. Father Dunstan was a world famous artist. There's more detail of, on the back of the... Uh, yeah, um, I don't think it's readable though. No. But if you, if you Google <coughs> Dunstan Massey, M-A-S-S-E-Y, I'm sure you'll see many of not yet, many of his artwork, much of his artwork online. Benedictine life is characterized by obedience, self-denial, moderation, and good order, and life in common, with goods shared according to need. In Benedict's, um, the, the lady we spoke of who became a hermitess, what first of all joined the Benedictines. And she said to me once, she had been a businesswoman in West Vancouver. And she said, in business, you have a job to do and you have to do it no matter how long it takes. She said, one of the most difficult things for me in Benedictine life was good order. For an hour, you are to work on this. Then you stop, the bell rings and you do something else. You don't keep going on the job. I sometimes remind my students, because I teach math there two days a week, and sometimes the bell goes and one of the students is still working on a math problem and he stands up for the prayer, but he's still working on the math problem. And you say, in Benedictine life, you stop when the bell goes. Yeah. It's an order life. Now it's time for prayer, even yeah. though you were doing something else, yeah. which stop. may have been good. Yeah. Yeah. In Benedict's rule... God is a judge who protects the weak from tyranny. Abbots, who are elected for life by the monks, are warned that they will answer at the last judgment for any abuse of their office. Benedict sees God in many places, in the liturgy particularly, the divine office and the mass. Benedictines try never to let carelessness, such as tardiness, disrupt the liturgy. Um, although it's a, it's a monastery for monks, they do um, invite the public to their 10 o'clock mass on Sunday morning. If you do go there, don't be late, but you'll also notice how reverently the mass is said. It's beautiful, yeah. No chatting in church before or after. Benedict sees God in the abbot, through whom the monks perceive God's will. The abbot consults the whole community on important matters, but only he can call a meeting, set the agenda, hear the testimony or evidence, and make the final decision. They particularly see God in guests, whom they treat as Christ. 
Hospitality is peculiarly Benedictine, is a peculiarly Benedictine virtue, and the guest master has an important role. So you'll notice as you leave the main road, as you go on to the Abbey property, guests are welcome. And people can go there for private retreats, public retreats, of course, if you book them ahead of time. But when you do go there, the guest master and one or more of the other monks will serve you at mealtimes. Hospitality is a particularly Benedictine virtue. They also see God in the sick and in the youngest monks, for God often reveals what is better to the younger, the rule says. To Benedict, everything in our natural lives is important in our supernatural lives. For example, tools are handled carefully by the workers and inventoried by the superiors. Waiters and readers at meals are blessed during the liturgy of the hours as they begin and end their week of service. Benedictines often spend their lives with the same people, so they become familiar with their faults. The solution to problems is not change of place or companions, Benedict says, but patience, which he associates with Christ's passion. In fact, the two words come from the same base in Latin. Benedictine life includes Lectio Divina, literally divine reading, praying God's word through Lectio, reading, Meditatio, reflection, oratio, praying, and contemplatio, silently listening. Then the Carmelite spirituality. The name comes from Mount Carmel, the high ridge near the modern port of Haifa in Israel. Here, between 1206 and 1214, Patriarch Albert of Jerusalem, a patriarch is a bishop of a very important diocese, gave a group of lay hermits a formula of life based on silence, solitude, and continuous prayer, mostly the Psalms. They chose Mount Carmel because that was where the prophet Elijah, who is considered a model for monks and hermits, had challenged the prophets of Baal. You can read that in the, ninth, in, in the first book of Kings, back in the 9th century BC. However, the chapel of the Carmelites was dedicated to Mary, and by the middle of the 13th century, they were called Brothers of the Blessed Virgin Mary of Mount Carmel. Carmelite hermits began migrating to Cyprus, Sicily, England, and France about 1238. Finding their lifestyle unsuited to Western Europe, they asked the Pope to approve a revision of their formula. The resulting changes allowed them to settle in towns, live together in dormitories, still with individual cells, eat together in refectories, and sing the divine office together. To prepare themselves to preach, teach, and administer the sacraments, they began to study, and by the end of the 13th century were established at the universities of Cambridge, Oxford, and Paris. In the 15th century, Carmelite devotion to Mary began to center on her alleged appearance to St. Simon Stock, during which she is said to have given him the brown scapula. Monks and nuns wear what is basically a long piece of cloth with a hole in it for the head, goes down the back and down the front. Lay people can wear a very abbreviated version of this. So this goes over the head with an image of Our Lady giving the scapula to St. Simon Stock on one side, and Our Lady of Mount Carmel holding Christ on the other. This one is encased in plastic. This one would be a lot more comfortable, but it's basically the same thing. Do you want to hold those a bit closer to the camera, Father? Thank you.
So it's just a little piece of cloth front and back with tapes over the shoulder, suitable for being worn under lay people's clothing. In 1542, a second Carmelite order was founded for women. The Carmelite order has undergone many reforms, for there has always been tension between the vision of its founders and the requirements of modern life. The most significant reform began with the midlife conversion of Doña Teresa de Ahumada at the Carmelite Monastery of the Incarnation in Avila, Spain at the end of the 1500s. After that conversion, she called herself Teresa of Jesus. She was declared the first woman doctor of the church, that's sort of equivalent to a spiritual PhD, by Pope Paul VI in 1970. As her collaborator, Teresa chose the newly ordained John of St. Matthias, who was thinking of transferring to the Carthusians, a strict contemplative order founded some years before, because he wanted to live in greater solitude. Under Teresa's guidance, John decided to remain a Carmelite. Like Teresa, he marked this decision by changing his name. He became John of the Cross. He was declared a doctor of the church in 1926 by Pope Pius XI. For Teresa and John, the goal of the contemplative life is the union of the soul with God in love. John's poetry, particularly, is a union of mysticism and theology. The next most widely known Carmelite is Therese Martin, Sister Therese of the Child Jesus and of the Holy Face. And Father Dunstan, the same Benedictine um, artist we were talking about, sketched, apparently in a very short time, this is St. Therese herself, um, taken from photographs of her. Her full name was St. Teresa of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face. And Father Dunstan has given the Child Jesus the appearance of Therese as a child. It's very beautifully done. Um, I was given this by one of the monks at the Abbey, Father Peter, because um, St. Therese um, is a very important saint in our family. She lived a little way of trust and love that went to the heart of gospel simplicity. Now, she was canonized in the early 1920s when my parents were in elementary school. When they met in 1948, they discovered that they both had the same devotion to St. Therese and her little way. So um, I'm the oldest of their eight children. They gave me Therese, spelt the French way, as my second name. They also chose the names of St. Therese's sisters, many of whom also became Carmelite nuns, for the names of my sisters. So I have a sister whose baptismal name is Marie Céline, she is now Sister Marie Therese in the Poor Clares in Mission. I have a Sister Marie Louise and another Marie Leone, all taken from. So when St. Therese's parents were canonized, it was a big event for our family. Pope Pius XI named Therese principal patroness of the foreign missions, in spite of the fact that she had never left her convent. She did it all by prayer. And Pope Pius XII named her secondary patroness of France in 1944. St. So Joan of Arc is the principal patroness. The best known 20th century Carmelites are St. Elizabeth of the Trinity and St. Edith Stein, a Jew who became Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross and died at Auschwitz and Blessed Titus Bransma, a journalist and a professor at a university in Holland who died at Dachau. Then the Dominican spirituality, the order of preachers. Maybe just before we pass on from the Carmelites, 
just to mention that we have them here in at St. Edmund's Parish. We'll also be mentioning this later, but also just east of Mission, they have a house yeah. of spirituality. Yeah. Then Francis, no. Dom Dominican. I've lost my place. Dominican spirituality. Their proper name is the Order of Preachers, but it was founded by St. Dominic Guzman, so it's usually called the Dominicans. It includes a first order for consecrated men, a second order for consecrated women, and a third order for lay people. Dominic was born into an ancient family in Calaruega, Spain. During the famine of 1191, he sold all his goods, including his books, to help the poor. Dominic was ordained a priest in 1199. In 1206, on his way to Denmark through Languedoc, France, with his bishop, Diego d'Azevedo, he heard papal envoys, delegates from the Pope, in Montpellier, France, denouncing the Albigensian heresy, which held that the world was intrinsically evil. At Dominic and Diego's suggestion, the envoys dismissed their large retinues and began to exemplify poverty instead. At this time, only bishops had the right to preach. However, in a letter dated November 17, 1206, <clears throat> Pope Innocent III granted this right to Dominic, and from then on, Dominic signed himself Brother Dominic, preacher. For the Dominicans, you always see Dominican father so-and-so or sister so-and-so, OP, Order of Preachers. Right. After his bishop returned to Spain, Dominic remained in Languedoc as parish priest at Fanjou, near Pruy. In 1207, he founded a women's monastery there. He eventually settled with a few followers in Toulouse, in the south of France. In 1215, he attended the Fourth Lateran Council in Rome, because it was held in the Lateran Palace, where he won approval for an order of preachers who would live under Augustine's rule, but with supreme authority given to the vote of the monks instead of to the abbot. Dominic spent the rest of his life establishing friaries. Now that word was used for the homes of monks who travel, often as beggars, instead of remaining in their monasteries. So friars include Dominicans and Franciscans. He spent the rest of his life then establishing friaries in Italy, Spain, and France. In 1221, he set out for Hungary to preach to the pagans, but fell ill and had to return to Bologna, Italy, where he died and was buried. One of the marks of the Dominicans is that they usually wear a white habit with, with some black, but yeah. a white habit. And uh, in fact, um, St. Pius V was, the Pope Pius V was a Dominican. And because since then, the Popes have always worn white. Ah. The Dominican vocation is principally preaching. Accordingly, in their community, in their community life, sorry, accordingly, in their community, life, liturgy, contemplation, study, and poverty are at the service of preaching, which entails travel. For example, they chant the divine office succinctly, and for the manual labor of Benedictines, they substitute the study of scripture and the art of preaching. Each monastery has a theological expert called a lector. Three Dominicans are doctors of the church. St. Albert the Great, who lived from 1200 to 1280. St. Thomas Aquinas, who lived from 1225 to 1274. And St. Catherine of Siena in the 1300s. Thomas... Uh, Thomas Aquinas, who twice held a chair in theology at the University of Paris, spent most of his career as a lector. 
Convinced that the intellect is primary, since love flows from knowledge, he wrote Summa Theologiae, a summary of theology, which scales heights unthinkable to human intelligence, Pope Leo XIII said. Here I have these six books that Father is showing you. Five volumes. Five volumes. Oh, I thought it was six. Five volumes. Five volumes. Um, that's going to fall, I think. Um, this is the Summa Theologiae, written in a form of teaching. Here is the question. Here is the answer people give. Here is the objection I make to it. Here is the objection people reply back. It's very much, very, it's difficult to cite. You have to learn how to cite his work, but it's very easy to read. Catherine of Siena, a lay Dominican from the age of 18, lived as a recluse in her parents' home, going out only for mass until 1368, when she began to work with others among the sick and destitute. People began to seek her out. From hours of conversation, she learned theological argument and biblical interpretation and began to teach what she knew of God from her experience. In 1376, she induced Pope Gregory XI to return to his diocese, Rome, from Avignon in France, where he and six other popes had resided since 1309. As her fame spread, Catherine was asked to mediate in the highly complicated politics of 14th century Italy. At that time, Italy was not one country, but a large number of very small principalities, very often at odds with each other. At the order of Pope Urban VI, who found himself embroiled in schism, she set up house in Rome, where she counseled the Pope and the Cardinals and directed her disciples. So the Dominicans are very proud of their <coughs> saints. Then Franciscan spirituality. St. Francis, who never became a priest, he was a deacon all his life. Born about the same time, he lived from 1182 to 1226, was born in Assisi, Italy, the son of a successful cloth merchant who lived a comfortable life. In his testament, dictated shortly before he died, Francis related how, as a young man, he encountered a leper. His own values were overturned, he said, from bitterness to sweetness. From then on, he lived a life of penance according to the form of the Holy Gospel. Francis built the first nativity scene at Grecio in Italy, from which our own custom derives. It's always been a big thing in our family to make the Christmas crib, as we called it, there's a photograph at the bottom of the one I put under my Christmas tree. There's and the Christmas it's, tree. there's the Christmas tree above it. It's very much, it was very much in my family, the focus of our Christmas tree, the Christmas crib. I remember as a child being thrilled because Dad used to let us open our eyes to say prayers. Also, since I've married and moved into the apartment where I live, I've made panels with holes in them that I can put lights through to make a Christmas crib, um, actually two Christmas cribs, on the upstairs of my apartment so that they can shine out. And I do get comments about them. If I don't put them up exactly the same day, people will say, people who live round about and people, are you going to put up your, uh, your Christmas thing this year? Just helps to remind people. Each of so, these panels is about a meter and a half. High and about yeah. 24 inches wide, if you don't mind me mixing them up. This <laughs> one is St. Joseph. This is Our Lady holding the child. This is a shepherd with a lamb. This is a king with a star. And this one is an angel. With a tail in a different window. <laughs> <laughs> So St. Francis really started something. Francis's canticle of brother's son 
shows that he saw God's wisdom, power, and goodness in all creation, worms as well as flowers. The opening hymn of today's, I was so struck by the uh, singing struck? praises to the Father. No, but everything yeah. reflecting yes. the goodness everything. of God yeah. and singing his praises, whether it be the waters in, of the deep or the stars in the heavens or mm -hmm. the birds flying. It's a beautiful hymn. Francis is said to be the man most like Christ, not only in his lifestyle, but also because he was given the stigmata, that is, the wounds of Christ, in his hands, feet, and side. Moved by his example, St. Clair of Assisi began a life of penance on Palm Sunday in 1212. She was received by the Franciscan brothers at the little church of St. Mary of the Angels, becoming the first Franciscan woman. Like Francis, Claire prized poverty. That's perhaps the keynote of the Franciscans. However, at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, the church refused to recognize any new rules of consecrated life. So she was forced to accept the rule of Benedict. However, at her request, Pope Innocent III confirmed her proposal of most high poverty, assuring her that no one can compel you to receive possessions. In Claire's own testament, probably written soon after her rule was approved by Pope Innocent IV in 1247, she stated that the Son of God never wished to abandon this holy poverty while he lived in the world, and that she wanted to imitate the God who was placed poor in the crib, lived poor in the world, and remained naked on the cross. Accordingly, Claire's sisters live on charity. The poor Claire's in mission don't do anything to earn money, they live on what people give them, and they never beg. In Claire's letters to St. Agnes of Bohemia, who founded a monastery of the Poor Sisters in 1234, Claire explained that by joining Christ in poverty, <coughs> she embraced him as her spouse. Franciscan friars focus on Christ in the created world. The sisters focus on Christ crucified. The sisters often live in enclosure. They don't leave their convent except for emergencies. And that enclosure, far from locking out the world, concentrates their attention on Christ in the frail humanity of each sister and each person who comes to their door. There are several Franciscan communities of men and several communities of women and they differ quite largely all very much with these focal points yes. but for instance we have the poor Claire's mission we also have the Franciscan sisters of the Eucharist yes uh, that I often say mass for and their emphasis on adoration of the Eucharist and preparation for mass is is, is beautiful to see yeah let's take a break at that point Then Ignatian spirituality. This is very much at the time of the Reformation in Europe. St. Ignatius he was born in 1491 and lived till 1556. He was born into a noble family at Loyola, Spain. He began his adult life as courtier, gentleman, and soldier. However, in 1521, as he recovered from a severe leg wound at Pamplona, Spain, he read the lives of Christ and the saints and became a soldier of Christ instead. In 1534, he founded the Army-like, that's how it's organized, Society of Jesus, the Jesuits, approved by Pope Paul III in 1540. For the rest of his life, besides his direct pastoral work, he organized a vast missionary network. The ones we call the Canadian Martyrs were all Jesuits, or at least the Catholics were. He undertook sensitive diplomatic tasks 
and established colleges, universities, and charitable institutions. His writings include the Spiritual Exercises, the Constitutions of the Society of Jesus, and thousands of letters. The exercises are written as a manual for a spiritual director. Nevertheless, they instruct that director to permit the creator to deal directly with the creature and the creature directly with his creator and Lord. Organized into weeks, they comprise meditations and contemplations to rid the soul of unhealthy attachments to created things and discover the will of God. But first, they purify the memory and the imagination so that decisions will be uninfluenced by the flesh or any inordinate attachment. They also give detailed instructions on how to pray the purgative way, the illuminative way, and the unitive way, including how to use time, weather, light, darkness, fasting, penance, posture, and recollection. Ignatius knew the importance of religious emotion, as his autobiography and spiritual diary show. Ignatian spirituality unites the soul's interior life with the church's liturgical, sacramental life, especially through confession and frequent mass and communion. Today, of course, one of the most famous um, Jesuits, Jesuits is, is, is Pope, Pope Francis. Francis. Yes. And he's got a particular devotion to St. Francis of Assisi. Yeah. So you see they have these spiritualities are complementary, they work together. Yep. Then Salesian spirituality. This is the spirituality of St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane Francis de Chantal. Again, about the time of the Reformation in Europe. Their spirituality is embodied in Francis's Introduction to the Devout Life, written in 1609, and Treatise on the Love of God, 1616, both of which are still in print. Born at the castle of Sales, the French pronounce it Sal, in Savoy, Italy, Francis was a brilliant student of law, theology, and philosophy. But he gave up his prospects to become a priest. He was ordained in 1593, and in 1602 made Bishop of Geneva in Calvinist Protestant Switzerland, where he worked as spiritual director, writer, preacher, correspondent, reformer, and advocate of lay devotion. He was declared a doctor of the church by Pope Pius IX in 1877 and made patron of the Catholic press by Pope Pius XI in 1923, when Father was finally, after years of being interim editor of the BC Catholic, when Archbishop Carney finally made him editor, he gave him a picture of St. Francis de Sales, which Father had in his office over his desk, and I suppose the present editor does too. Yes, I left it in, in the office for, uh, yeah. for Paul Schratz, who is the current editor. Jane, born into a noble family in Dijon, France, married the Baron Christophe de Chantal in 1592. When her husband died in 1601, she made a vow of continence. In 1610, Francis and Jane co-founded the religious community of the Visitation of Holy Mary, referring to Our Lady's visiting of her cousin Elizabeth right after she herself had conceived Jesus. And they designed it for women unable to endure the severe asceticism of other religious orders. Before she died, St. Therese of Lisieux advised her superiors to keep the convent warmer. Religious life is not easy. It's never easy, and but it used to be harder than it is. But when you visit a convent or a community, you often think, well, I could like this. <laughs> it's not soft. No. 
So their original plan for this order of nuns was that it be an unenclosed community of women, not cloistered, as I think all religious orders for women had been until then, and that they would be devoted to visiting the poor. And you couldn't do that if you were enclosed. No. The motto of this community, Live Jesus, is found at the head of all Jane's letters and throughout Francis's writings. We can live Jesus in any circumstances. For example, Francis said that the purpose of his book, Introduction to the Devout Life, was to instruct those who live ordinary lives in towns, within families, or at court. Francis said, and I like this very much, we live not only by God's signified will, which means the counsels he desires us to follow, like the Ten Commandments, etc., but also by the will of God's good pleasure, which is known to us by events. In other words, God directs us not only by the commandments, but also by the circumstances and opportunities of our daily life. We should serve God with devotion, that is, a spiritual activity and liveliness which causes us to work briskly and lovingly in performing as many good works as possible, whether commanded or merely inspired. And you might like to read what Francis said in more detail in footnote 63. Francis notes that Jesus lived out his union with his father among people as an advocate for the marginalized, an agent of reconciliation, and a compassionate presence. When he died, Francis says, he knew all of us by name and by surname. We should live Jesus, then, in human relationships, remaining detached from our own expectations and respecting each person's liberty. When I was administrator of St. Francis de Sales Parish for a while back, a little back, way, a little time ago, one of the things I was impressed by was the number of the parishioners who had read the life of St. Francis. Or his and books. His books. Wonderful. And really tried to implement the, his way of life in their, in their spiritual life. Wow. Jane and Francis manifested the gentle Jesus. Jane in her governance and spiritual direction of her sisters, and Francis in a number of episodes which earned him the title, The Gentleman Saint. This is something which came from a Canadian, Lee Hunt, who was writing in the London Journal in 1835. I think I'm right in saying he's a Canadian, I'm pretty sure. The Visitation Order was the only order Francis and Jane founded. However, their spirituality inspired a number of others. The Salesians of St. John Bosco, the Missionaries of St. Francis de Sales, and the Oblates of St. Francis de Sales, all founded in the 19th century. Now something a bit different, lay movements. By lay, Lay people are those who are not ordained or specially consecrated. The Second Vatican Council in the 1960s stressed lay spirituality. I remember that my dad pointed out at that time that until then, in England certainly, and I think in Canada, uh, people had said, oh, Sansa is going into the church, meaning his, his occupation is going to be as a priest. Or religious. Or religious, as though the rest of us were not in the church. And I remember many years ago now um, being asked to give a talk on the role of lay people in the church. The more I thought of it, I thought, what a silly thing to say. It's like saying, what's the role of the golf players in a golf club? They are the golf club. We are the church. The church is for you. Church. For us. You are the servants of yes. everybody yeah. else. You are ordained to serve the people, God's people. So the Second Vatican Council stressed this. Calling the church the whole people of God, it said that through their baptism, lay people share 
in the priestly, prophetic, and royal office of Christ, and are called to the fullness of Christian life and the perfection of charity. In other words, holiness is not just for consecrated people. Lay people are not entitled to shirk their earthly responsibilities on the grounds that their eternal destiny is in heaven, the Council said. Nor must they immerse themselves in earthly activities, as if religion were nothing more than the fulfillment of acts of worship and the observance of a few moral obligations. Rather, lay people must imitate Christ who worked as a craftsman and carry out their earthly activities in such a way as to integrate human, domestic, professional, scientific, and technological enterprises with religious values. In fact, the council said, the effort to infuse a Christian spirit into the mentality, customs, laws, and structures of the community is so much the duty and responsibility of the laity that it can never be properly performed by others. As a result, the Council sparked a number of spiritual movements among lay Catholics. The Vatican has formally approved about 120 of them. So we can only mention a few. But in, in addition, I would like, before we go into the specific um, communities, that have been approved, just the whole atmosphere of the Second Vatican Council in emphasizing the, the role of the laity, the position of the laity, the fact that the church is for the laity is, is, is beautiful. The Second Vatican Council is very important. So all we can do is mention a few that have impressed Father and me. And been related to this diocese particularly. Yes. One of them is Catholic Christian Outreach. CCO helps university students live the Catholic faith fully. University is a difficult time for a lot of young people. They leave home. They find that the world is not the Catholic world they may have been brought up in. And quite a lot of them lose their faith. This helps university students live their faith fully. Founded in 1988 by Andre and Angel Regnier in Saskatoon, it became an incorporated nonprofit organization in 1992. Its headquarters moved to Ottawa in 2006. Beginning with four missionaries at the University of Saskatchewan, CCO now comprises over a hundred missionaries at the University of Saskatoon, sorry, at 16 universities from Victoria to Newfoundland. In BC, it is present at UBC, SFU, and UVic. CCO organizes an annual Christmas conference called Rise Up and an annual mission called Impact, which gathers students from across Canada for a summer of missionary work in one city. They live in community and work as teams in parishes, leading faith studies, organizing retreats, etc. Impact also features a weekly event called Cornerstone, a courageous Catholic program and the monthly summit that includes worship, Eucharistic adoration, and reconciliation. I've been very impressed when I've gone to help out at the different parishes where they have this, these um, monthly reconciliations, where the, the devotion of the young people and their determination, their desire to live Christian lives, good Catholic lives. I was first encountered the Catholic Christian Outreach when two of their members came from Saskatoon about 25 years ago. And they were there at Sunday morning mass and I got talking to them and I've been supportive of them ever since and I just delight in the work that they're doing. Then the charismatic movement. Just as on the first Pentecost, there was an extraordinary descent of the Holy Spirit, so today there is a similar effusion of spiritual gifts or charisms. Charisms has a particular meaning in Catholic literature. It comes from the Greek charismata, which means gifts of grace or free gifts, and it means extraordinary, transitory, gratuitous blessings conferred directly for others' good and indirectly for the possessor's good. 
so that today there is a similar effusion of spiritual gifts or charisms. They are clearly perceptible in personally felt experiences of the Holy Spirit's presence. In preternatural gifts, not strictly supernatural, but beyond the natural. Gifts like those described in the Bible, for example, prophecy, speaking in tongues, and healing. And in strong impulses to communicate these blessings to others. The only obstacle to this charismatic outpouring of the Holy Spirit is our own timidity, a fear that he cannot do today what he did in the time of the apostles. Recent popes, Paul VI, John Paul II, and Benedict, have all spoken in favor of this movement. And I'm very much. Probably Pope Francis has too, but I haven't seen it. It's we'll very much the spirit of the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah. Then, Couples for Christ. CFC was founded by 16 couples in 1981 in the Philippines. Through informal weekly discussions, it helps couples and their families form interpersonal relationships with Jesus Christ. Starting in 1993, it extended its ministry to Kids for Christ, Youth for Christ, Singles for Christ, Handmaids of the Lord, and servants of the Lord. Now present in 163 countries, and don't forget that all the details we have in here were written last summer, so <laughs> all of these figures could be different by now, but present at that time anyway, in 163 countries, CFC was approved by the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines in 1996 and by the Vatican in 2000. Pope Francis invited its leaders to the Extraordinary Synod on the Family in 2014. I've been very impressed in different parishes where Couples for Christ have brought people back to the faith. They're helping couples who are not married or something like this to come back into integration with the church and get their marriages blessed and things put right. It's, they've done a lot of very, very wonderful work. Then the community of San Egidio. This community began in Rome in 1968, when Andrea Riccardi and other students and young professionals accepted a local priest's challenge to live like the early disciples, gathering for prayer and meals, and practicing the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, which we've listed in footnote 81. The name of this community comes from the church of San Egidio, which housed it starting in 1973. The community now includes over 50,000 members in more than 70 countries. The Vatican recognized it in 1986. Now, Father and I heard about it um, through, when you were editor of the BC Catholic, again and again, speaking about conflicts in the world. Catholic News Service, which the BC Catholics subscribed to at that time, used to mention the community of San Egidio having set up efforts. Meet, meetings and yeah. efforts, yeah. So it's so impressive that we began to look it up. I'm just going to read footnote 82. The community of San Egidio is credited with success in Sudan, Burundi, the former Yugoslavia, Albania, Mozambique, where they helped end a 16-year civil war, Algeria and Guatemala, where they helped end the civil war in 1996. Apparently, what they did, they were known to be a religious group and not a political group, so they would just invite heads or representatives of warring sides to meetings. Please God, they can come back into Sudan right now, which yes. is in turmoil. Anyway. But they don't just stick to that sort of thing. They also host an annual follow-up to the Summit of World Religious Leaders in Assisi, Italy, called by Pope John Paul II in 1986. They run soup kitchens in Rome and social services for Rome's homeless, elderly, and immigrant population. Now, this next paragraph is really just boasting about their 
success in top-level peacemaking efforts. The organization was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1994, 95, and 2002, formally recognized by the New York City Council in 2000, and awarded the World Methodist Peace Award in 1997, the Nawano Peace Prize and UNESCO's Felix Hufwe Buanyi Peace Prize in 1999, the Bolson Prize and the International Peacemaking Award from Common Ground in 2004, the International Charlemagne Prize in 2009, the Chirac Foundation Award for Conflict Prevention in 2010, the Golden Doves for Peace Award in 2016, and the Interfaith Center of New York's Founders Award in 2017. They're not, as far as I know, involved in any way in our archdiocese here in Vancouver. It's one of the few groups of laity that aren't. But people who are involved in other spiritualities may be attracted to the work that they're doing mm -hmm. and, be, and be supportive of them in their, their good work. We can all be peacemakers. Then, anyway, and again, you know, we updated this last summer, I think. I think we would have updated this bit last summer, um, but Google it, the community of San Egidio, see what they're doing now. Then the Focolari movement. In 1943, Chiara Lubitsch, and who died in 2008, and a few friends in Trent, Italy, founded the Focolari movement in order to focus their lives on the gospel. Focolari is Italian for hearth or fireplace. The movement now has over 140,000 committed members and 2.2 million associates in some 180 countries. It stresses obedience to the church and adherence to Focolari statutes, approved by the Vatican in 1990. Almost 3,650 Focolarini, as they're called, have made promises of celibacy and live together in single-sex houses. Another 2,180 married members actively share their community and prayer life and contribute to their support. Other branches of the movement are the 20,000 volunteers who share the Focolari ideals, the 60,000 Gen or Focolari youth, more than 2,000 diocesan priests who serve Focolari communities, new families which meet for prayer and support, and New Humanity, which promotes peace, dialogue, and social change. Then the neocatechumenal. I just way. mentioned again with regard to Focolari, I've had them in different parishes where I am, and I'm very, very impressed with their spirituality and the work that they do, and just uh, as a lay movement, it's, it's mm -hmm. wonderful. Then the neocatechumenal way. This was formed in Madrid in 1964 by Kiko Arguello and Carmen Hernandez, and its statutes received papal approval in 2008. Based on the catechumenate, which is the pre-baptismal instruction, of the early church, it offers post-baptismal education to Catholic adults in some 40,000 small parish-based communities with about 1 million members worldwide. It also runs a hundred seminaries, including one in Toronto, one in Quebec City, and one at Blessed Sacrament Parish in Vancouver. The, the present Bishop the, of Whitehorse. Yes, Bishop Hector Villa of Whitehorse is a member of the Neocatechumenal Way. And, and he came from this um, seminary, I believe. Um, he no, was, he was from down east. Oh, all but right. We've got some, some seminarians and some priests in the diocese now. Yeah, Who Father are, Giovanni Chiesari yes. came from that um, seminary in Blessed Sacrament Parish. Then Opus Dei, and before we say anything else, if you know if what you know about Opus Dei comes from the completely fictional thriller, The Da Vinci Code, put it right out of your mind. <laughs> Saint Jose Maria Escrive de Balagüe. 1902 to 1975, who founded Opus Dei in 1928. He was born in Barbastro, Spain, and ordained a priest in 1925. In 1946, he moved to Rome, where he lived the rest of his life. Opus Dei, which means the work of God, 
which received Vatican approval in 1943, has centers in about 300 dioceses worldwide. Its 75,000 lay members are guided by 1,350 priest members. Pope John Paul II made it a personal prelature in 1982, but I've just read that Pope Francis has transferred it to one of the, to come under the um, governance of one of the Vatican Curia. Um, so it's a bit different. There, was, there were no other personal prelatures. And they, they have, uh, anyway, it's been changed. We'll have to update that for next year. Members stress unity of life, living one's faith throughout the day through the sanctification of work, doing one's best and offering all work to God, thus making it a never-ending prayer. Opus Dei claims that its members walk into a church building and walk out of it for the same reason, to get closer to God. I first read about them in the early 1970s, I think, and I was very, very impressed by the life of some of the young people who were striving for sanctity Holiness, yeah. in, the, in their lives. Yeah. Now, you'll notice that a number of these, well, religious movements and lay movements approved by the Pope at this date, approved by the Vatican. So let's just talk about why this is important. Throughout Christian history, holy people have handed on their personal charisms to their followers. There are different gifts, but the same spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord. There are different works, but the same God who accomplishes all of them in everyone, St. Paul said. And it's worth reading footnote 92. In fact, I'm going to read some of it. St. Paul said, to each person, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, the Spirit gives wisdom in discourse. To another, the power to express knowledge. Through the Spirit, one receives faith. By the same Spirit, another is given the gift of healing, and still another, miraculous powers, etc., etc. In 1992, Archbishop Adam Exner, OMI of Vancouver, warned that spiritual gifts must be carefully discerned. I was going to mention this before, but I knew it was coming up. Father said, I've been impressed with their spirituality. That's a word which is being used a lot today by people who sometimes don't even believe in God. When people say to me, um, I'm not religious, but I am spiritual, I say, oh, I hope you realize that there are evil spirits as well as good. Spirituality is not in itself good or evil. It simply means spirit as opposed to body. Not that you meant it the wrong way, Father. I'm not saying that. But the Archbishop warned that spiritual gifts must be carefully discerned to see which are good and which are bad. With the help of wise and prudent spiritual directors, pastors, bishops, and the Christian community, the fact that someone has a strong subjective inspiration and conviction does not automatically mean that it comes from the Holy Spirit, he said. All of us are subject to the influence of both the good spirit, the Holy Spirit, who is God, and the bad spirit. That is why St. John says in the, in the Gospel, or is it in his letter? It's in his letter. <laughs> He said, put the spirits to a test to see if they belong to God, because many false prophets have appeared in the world. Transformation by the Holy Spirit, show, by the Holy Spirit shows itself in three ways, the Archbishop said. A deeper appropriation of the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, meaning a deeper integrating them into our lives as part of our own lives a deeper appreciation of the sacraments of reconciliation and the Holy Eucharist, and a new zeal for evangelization. And these are all points that Bishop Exner stressed for us. Yep. Pope John Paul II 
said that the Spirit's gifts are to be accepted with thanksgiving. I'll let you read what Pope John Paul said about that in footnote 96. But judgment about their genuineness and their ordered use belongs to those who preside over the church. In fact, he said, the ability to make such judgments is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit, given in various degrees to those who are ordained, bishops, priests, and deacons. One example of such a judgment is the 52-page document published February 3, 2003, by a working group on new religious movements from two of the pontifical councils. It was entitled, Jesus Christ, the Bearer of the Water of Life, a Christian Reflection on the New Age. That judgment shows clearly that New Age is not Catholic. Although we talk about this in, under Catholic spiritualities, it's to emphasize the but fact that not. it is not. Right. Yeah. The word spirituality doesn't mean necessarily something good. The devil is a spirit. So let's just sort of warn people again about this. New Age leads people astray. Today there is great interest in the importance of man's spiritual dimension and its integration with the whole of life, the search for life's meaning, the link between human beings and the rest of creation, the desire for personal and social transformation, and the rejection of a rationalistic and materialistic view of humanity. That's a quotation from that document. There is great interest in spiritual things. However, instead of turning to the Catholic Church for the truth, people are turning to ancient Gnostic ideas under the guise of the New Age. We cannot delude ourselves that this will lead toward a renewal of religion. That's from Pope John Paul. Gnosticism, which he's denouncing, is the theory of salvation by knowledge. I know something you don't know, so therefore I am going to be saved. As early as the first century, Gnostics, disciples of the pre-Christian pantheistic sects, claimed to know the mysteries of the universe. Gnosticism has sometimes taken the form of a philosophical movement, but more often the characteristics of a religion or para-religion in conflict with all that is essentially Christian. For example, Gnosticism rejects divine revelation and denies that the church has the authority to interpret it. The desire in, in, instead, the fact the very word gnosis comes or is related to the Greek word knowledge. The desire for God is written in our hearts. God has made us for himself and our heart is restless until it rests in him. In the, that's from St. Augustine. In the West, for a few centuries, Satan has tried to calm this restlessness with material goods and the power of science. But for many people, he has failed. That is why today we see a resurgence of spiritual restlessness and hunger. And Satan is ready with a new untruth, better suited to us today. It even borrows language from Christianity, but its meaning is profoundly untrue. Now, as far back as when it was, gosh, I've forgotten when it was written, but C.S. Lewis died in 1963, so it was well before then. I'm just going to quote footnote 113, which comes in Lewis's book, Paralandra. Um, Ransom is a practicing Christian. Weston, shortly after this conversation, invites the devil to possess him. A thing might be a spirit and not good for you, Ransom warns. And Weston says, I thought you religious people were all out for spirituality. Don't you worship God because he is a spirit? Good heavens, no, Ransom replies. There's nothing specially fine about simply being a spirit. The devil is a spirit. It's a good so you, warning. 
You do have to watch this word spirituality. And if you listen, as I often do, to, to the news, you'll see that the secular media is very, very imbued yep. with with this um, this idea of this, spirituality. Uh, this, yeah, this um, whole attitude towards it. And as long as they're talking the spirit, they think they're talking about something holy. Right. And I, and I think it's it's we've got to really be on our guard. Well, I heard somebody say this morning at church. Um, I assume that spirituality means faith in God. I thought, no, it doesn't. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> no, but a lot, a lot, a lot of people are in touch with the devils for their spirituality. Well, like I can't judge any particular person, but you can't help seeing by what they say that it doesn't come from God. Yes. In fact, I'm just going to mention this, talking about the, the gift that God has given the church, those who preside over the church, deacons, priests, and bishops, um, to help us discern the spirits. Many years ago now, we had somebody who came to our class. Um, and at the end of each class, she wanted to give us a sermon. Now, unfortunately, poor woman, she has such a strong accent that we couldn't tell what she was saying. But we did hear enough to, got to understand from her that she was receiving these revelations from God. So we simply had to cut them off. We have not, these have not been discerned. These have not been checked by the competent authorities in the church. And we just had to say, we don't quote even canonized saints, unless the catechism has quoted them. We stick to what the church calls public revelation, which we spoke about. Which talk was that in? We talked about public revelation. Oh, God's will. Yes. Yeah, some of the appendices <clears throat> there. Christ warned us, false messiahs and false prophets will appear, performing signs and wonders so great as to mislead even the chosen, if that were possible, he said. Remember, I have told you all about it beforehand. Stick to the church. So in conclusion, when the work which the Father gave the Son to do on earth was accomplished, the Holy Spirit was sent on the day of Pentecost in order that he might continuously sanctify the church. Make up holy. At Pentecost, the Holy Spirit endowed the church with various hierarchic and charismatic gifts so that she might make disciples of all nations. To this day, it is through these gifts that the Holy Spirit directs the church. Accordingly, there are many dwelling places in the Father's house. That was something um, that came in the reading from the gospel. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. If, if what did Christ say? If, it were, if not it were not so, would I have told you that I went to prepare a place for you? These, the, this language comes from the Jewish wedding customs. The betrothal would take place by which they became husband and wife, but they didn't live together. The husband would then go and prepare a place for his wife. And when it was ready, come to take her so that she could be where he was. And he's assuring us that there are many dwelling places in the father's house. However, there is only one way there, namely Jesus. And as St. Thomas found, you don't have to know much about where you're going. You just have to know the way, which is Jesus. The way, the, way, the, the truth, truth, and, and the, the life. life. No one comes to the Father except through him. I'm just looking to see if I missed reading something I did miss it. On page 620, I read that Pope John Paul II said that the Spirit's gifts are to be accepted with thanksgiving, but judgment about their genuineness and their ordered use belongs to those who preside over the church. In fact, he said, the ability to make such judgments is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit, given in various degrees to those who are ordained, bishops, priests, and deacons. And footnote 98 is worth reading. The fact that we can trust the ordained 
leaders of the church is a gift from the Holy Spirit. Now, in the bibliography, we've put all the different writings of the saints we mention, which are still in print. And if anybody wants to get hold of them, we can help you get hold of them. But we don't have them all. <laughs> don't even have them all on our bookshelves. Don't have it all. Now, in Appendix 1, on page 622, um, Again, this needs to be updated, but if any of these Catholic spiritualities appeal to you, here's how you can get in touch with them. Again, you may find it's out of date. If you really want to get in touch with them and this information is not up to date, please get in touch with me or Father. Our contact information is in the very beginning of the print material, and we will try and fix it up. <laughs> These things change, but they are, it's a very useful list for those who are seeking to develop their, their holiness yes. and closeness to God. Yeah. So, so you... this coming week, we'll conclude the um, Gospel of St. John, chapter 11 to 21. And you'll find that, that, as we heard in the beginning of the reading today, Jesus is referring to the Jewish wedding custom, as Maureen mentioned, and the preparation by the groom for his bride, for his wife, to take her to himself. In his 1947 encyclical, Mediata Dei, Pope Pius XII said that the church on earth, like the church in heaven, has many dwelling places. The Holy Spirit enlightens and guides souls to sanctity with various gifts. St. Teresa of Lisieux said, How different are the variety of ways through which the Holy the Lord leads souls. Souls are more different than faces, St. Teresa points out. Next week, then, we will hear about one of these ways of spirituality, of coming to God, and that is, which so many people engage in, that is, through marriage and the family. In the meantime, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. You're welcome.